Welcome to this video about Spire Global. Uh, we're going to do an interview with uh, Spire Global CEO, Peter Platzer. Peter Platzer will tell us about uh, Spire Global, about space takes, about the physics uh, between uh, behind Spire Global, uh, and um, help us understand the business model and the term of uh, Spire Global. I represent uh, an investment uh, managing firm from Denmark, uh, New Deal uh, Invest. Uh, we have a portfolio at eToro. Um, it's called NDI Future Tech. Uh, we have a public listed um, uh, fund in Denmark. Uh, the ticker is uh, PMI NDI. And we have a non-listed uh, fund in Denmark as well. We create broad tech portfolios um, of best and breed tech companies, i.e. The, the, the tech companies that we feel have the best technology within uh, different categories. We always go for the biggest companies within each uh, technology segment because they typically uh, have the best uh, chances and, and the best uh, odds. Space tech is very interesting now because we are at an inflection point in time for space tech. And there are three uh, major reasons for that this time is uh, right now. And there are sort of two, two sort of factors laying the base for everything, um, which is that SpaceX is reducing the launch cost a lot. So it, it gets orders of magnitude uh, cheaper to send um, measuring instruments, satellites into space and start gathering data. It's still extremely hard, like Peter Platzer will emphasize uh, during the interview, to do this. Uh, you cannot fix them when they're up there, for instance. You need to to make sure that it, that it works. And there is a lot of trial and error and iteration uh, on it to make it, it work. So that's a great mode for these uh, companies. And then the next thing is that um, is a, 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 a principle that actually Peter Platzer himself um, um, made in his um, during his um, um, years at, at university, and it's uh, Peter Platzer principle. It's it's that the uh, efficiency of the measuring instruments in space is uh, 10xing every five years. So um, so these two principles means that if you compare to 10 or or maybe even 20 years ago, you can get so much more data per dollar capex that you use on sending uh, measuring instruments into space. And the next thing that is happening these years is accelerated compute, which is really um, um, sort of basically just decreasing um, the cost of uh, creating um, creating knowledge uh, based on data uh, that you gather. Um, and this is really uh, Spire Global's uh, business model. They are a data collecting company uh, in space and they uh, sell the data they uh, they sell the answers based on the data so you can you can ask questions to spire global and they'll answer them and you can also ask uh, spire global to make predictions that's what the world calls ai right now but the um, the, the big contributing and accelerating factor right now is accelerated compute um yeah so and and so that means that spire global can can make their uh, make their products uh, cheaper uh, and better um, and thus sell them at a cost that is realistic for a lot of more customers to uh, to buy into. Uh, so uh, so that means the Spire Global will have aspiring business and that helps the uh, companies like um, Rocket Labs or SpaceX that are sending rockets into space. So it, it benefits the entire ecosystem. And with that, I'll just um, uh, go over to the uh, interview, uh, which, uh, yeah, um, um, yeah, it's just great uh, to hear um, a physicist and a, an enthusiast uh, tell us about Spire Global. Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, welcome, uh, Peter Platzer, CEO of uh, Spire Global. It's a great pleasure and an honor to, um, to have you here. And I look forward to learn about, a lot about Spire Global and a lot about uh, space tech. My pleasure. Um, uh, the honor is all mine. Thanks for inviting me, Matt. And I'm, I'm excited to talk about space. As you can imagine, I've been uh, wishing to do something with space to improve life on Earth ever since being a teenager. So you got to stop me when I keep on talking too long. <laughs> I'll do my best. It's perfect. So, uh, uh, Peter, start out by telling us about uh, Spire Global. I think uh, the audience will probably be a little bit familiar with the company, but uh, yeah. Sure. So Spire is a company with a mission to improve life on Earth using data and analytics from space. 
Uh, we were founded by, by three Europeans that went together uh, to university in Strasbourg um, to get a degree in space science and management back in uh, 2011. And then uh, graduated in 2012, uh, started the company in the typical grungy garage uh, in San Francisco that, of course, uh, is now built into intellectual condominiums. But that's where we started in September of 2012, so 12, 12 years ago, um, and built our first um, our satellite there. I think uh, if you say your audience is familiar with Spire, I'm sure they're familiar with many space companies, and it can at times be a little bit overwhelming. So what we help people is to recognize that there are three distinct um, categories of satellites, and they are, as the McKinsey people would say, um, uh, totally exhaustive and mutually exclusive in a sense that they are self-contained and they don't compete with each other. Of course, there is competition inside those three groups, and we call them um, for easy memory, uh, looking, talking, and listening spacecraft. So uh, looking are spacecraft that use uh, reflections of the sunlight on the surface of Earth as it goes towards the heavens. That's how they capture their information. So works really well during the day um, and in good weather conditions. And companies there that you might have heard of is anything from a Maxar, a Planet, a Black Sky, Satellogic, Airbus. Uh, those are all companies in that looking segment. And then you have distinct, separate, and non-competitive, the talking segment. They are basically transportation companies of data from one spot on Earth via space to another spot on Earth. And they do this sometimes through so-called geostationary orbit, very, very far away. Um, uh, SES and, and Viasat are, are examples of that. Or uh, in more modern times, they also use low Earth orbit to do that. And there you have companies like Kuiper and Starlink and OneWeb and AST and others that make that transportation. Um, fun, uh, uh, fun side fact here, about 95% of the world's population lives on just 3% of the world's surface area. So because of that high concentration of people, those satellites in low Earth orbit that zip around planet Earth in about 90 minutes, um, they are idle most of the time, as only 3% of the time they're over an area which has a lot of people. Coming back to this, 95% of the world lives on just 3% of the world's surface area. And so that's why you get like those very, very large constellations, because most of the constellation is idle, not doing anything most of the time. And then there are the listening spacecraft. They use radio waves um, to observe what is happening on and around Earth. Radio waves have the, uh, the cool feature that they work during day and night. Of course, you know, they don't come from the sun and they work in all weather conditions. So as a matter of fact, actually, if you have the right science and technology, they can give you information about the weather. And in that segment, there is a number of companies like, uh, like a Hawkeye, a Cleos, a, a, a Planet IQ, a Geoptics, and Spire. Uh, uh, with Spire being the largest uh, uh, currently deployed company in the uh, listening segment, we're the only one with a fully deployed constellation um, over 100 um, uh, payloads that cover the Earth at least 100 times every single day. So every 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, depending on where you are, sometimes more often, one of our payloads covers wherever we are um, uh, and, and captures information. Um, we have uh, over 700 customers and uh, we are a public company for a few years now with uh, uh, about $120 million of subscription revenue uh, at, the, at the end of Q1 of this year which is the only way House Fire makes the services available. Again, coming back to this mission of improving life on Earth with data and analytics from space. Yeah, and and um, and and you're to be perceived as a data company, right? You you collect data and then you um, then you create services uh, from the data. Could you talk about that? Oh yeah, hundred percent. So. Anyone who understands a data company um, understands how Spire works. Like a data company has some way of gathering, you know, unique and valuable data that that company then packages and sells as a subscription that adds on then services on top of that and sells it as a subscription. And that's exactly how Spire operates. We collect the data once and then we sell it uh, acquires an unlimited amount of time, um, both as a, a raw data feed, we call that clean data. So it's very easy to use. Um, you know, we had customers from like finding out about Spire to having our data being pumped into the systems and used just within 48 hours. But then we also add uh, additional services. We uh, add simple analytics and fuse third-party data sets 
that a large group of our customers are interested in into one combined easy to use data feed for a subscription and uh, we call that smart data. And then we have this data vault that is filled every single day with hundreds of millions of data points from our clean and smart uh, data feeds. And then we mine that proprietary and very, very hard to acquire data for patents um, uh, with you know, AI and machine learning and advanced analytics to make predictions about what is going to happen and then sell um, various forms of predictions to our customers as a subscriptions. And then based on all of that, we also have full-blown decision support solutions that help customers based on what has happened in the past, what is happening right now, and what is likely to happen in the future, make smart and better decisions and faster decisions in this rapidly changing world with the help of a full-blown solution from Spire. So looking into um, Spire Global, um, you, you as an investor, you 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 end up thinking about uh, the physics uh, about this listening. How can you how can you hear a ship and how can you uh, geolocate a ship, a plane, and and you you assess Earth moistness. How on earth do you do that? And and you can hear a wildfire. And and uh, how do you predict a weather weather forecast? Could you? Um, Give us a quick crash course on, on the physics. You, you're wandering into dangerous territory, Matt, Sarah. I'm a, my <laughs> yeah. first credit degree is in physics, right? And and I love physics, and I'm, I'm glad that I got to study <laughs> physics and work in some of uh, some of the most fascinating places like Cern and Max Planck for a little bit. But um, uh, at, the, at the simplest way to think about it is, uh, if you ever looked at the water very still and then seen like a fish or a plant as it sticks out of the water, you know, the fish seems to be a little bit closer than it actually is, or the plant seems to have like a, a bend as they, you know, at the water surface area. And that has to do that the optical density of water and air is different. Or if you think about the old high school experiments where you take a, a ray of light onto a glass prisma, and then it gets split into the various colors of the, of the rainbow, which is exactly what happens when we see a rainbow. Um, long story short, um, electromagnetic waves, be that light or be that radio waves, which is the same thing, just at different frequencies, um, they interact with the medium through which they travel and that medium changes them. So if you have a, a very, very hot uh, pocket of air, um, you change how the light behaves. That's for example, how a Fata Morgana or a Mirage um, happens. Um, or you see like a, 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 an asphalt that is like very, very glittery is because the air is so hot and bends the light. And electromagnetic waves or radio waves are nothing else but light that is a little bit, you know, um, uh, frequency slower, even though it goes with the same speed of light. And when it comes to certain um, assets that we track, they have often collision avoidance beacons. So a ship, for example, by law has a little beacon which says, here I am, my name is Peter, I'm coming from here, I'm going to there, this is my speed, right? And that beacon would say this, you know, every minute, every two minutes, or sometimes every, every five seconds, if the ship is moving very fast and turning, for example. Now, those collision avoidance beacons are built to inform everyone in about a 50-mile radius around that ship or that aircraft. What the technology that Spire has built, though, is that it is flying at, call it, 500 kilometers, and it has fine enough ears, radios and antennas to listen to that collision avoidance beacon and pick up that piece of information. Now there's a whole bunch of gobbling. Think of it as like you are standing in a big party, someone next to you, you know, you hear them talk, like that's your circle, your 50 mile circle right around you. And if you're on the first level balcony and you look down, you have like 200 people and they're all talking simultaneously and it's quite difficult to discern what an individual is saying unless you deploy very, very sophisticated digital signal processing algorithms, which is exactly what we do from space, looking down or listening down onto the oceans and onto the you know, airspace, picking up those uh, collision avoidance beacons and then providing DSP algorithms to decipher and uh, decollide, as it's called them. And, and then have the individual messages uh, decoded and then we send this down as, as information to the ground. That software that you use to, to assess all that data, is that proprietary, something Spire has developed? Yeah, so all of the components, man, are proprietary to Spire. It's like the hardware, 
um, uh, the uh, the sensors, the spacecraft, the software, the analytics, all of that is fire. And, and all of it is, uh, you know, that's why they call it deep tech. When we actually when we started out, um, one of our uh, uh, radios, one of our hardware, and then the software that drives it is measuring how different temperature pockets change the bending of the microwaves coming off the GPS satellites. And it's like the tiniest of bending. And people at NASA said, I understand the physics, Peter, but it's against the laws of physics to build something that small, that is so sensitive that you can pick those things up. As you might have recently saw, you know, NASA signed like at another contract with us, almost $7 million. It increased it again from last year. So they're very, very happy customers of ours because we built this very, very deep, hard to replicate technology, both on the hardware side as well as on the software side. Uh, but let's look at uh, some use cases. Um, you're providing services for maritime and, and air traffic, and uh, you've, uh, you're commencing a collaboration with Sales and ESPP on space-based air traffic surveillance services. Could you explain the nature of these services and, and what advantages uh, space-based solutions offer? Yeah, of course. So when we started Spire, we had three business principles. Before we knew exactly what we we're going to do, we had based on the thesis that I had written an understanding that space technology is improving tenfold every five years. Or, you know, if you want to put it into more common terms, two and a half times every two years. Everyone is familiar with Moore's Law, which was about two times every two years, and how Moore's Law over many, many decades drove um, the dramatic change in the computer industry from mainframe computers to personal computers and then uh, uh, onto the internet. And in the space industry, there is a similar principle working um, uh, this uh, 10x every five years. Some people have called it the Plotzer principle after my thesis, but it's basically the same thing as Moore's Law. That was the starting point. But then we had three business principles. Number one, it is a data company um, which is only and exclusively available from space. And then there were two more principles. Um, and that is the core of like what you do with um, you know ship tracking and plane tracking. Because if a, um, uh, a ship leaves the shore about 50 miles out, it is invisible. So about 80% of its journey time, you don't know where the ship is. No one knows other than the ship itself. And the same is true for aircraft. And we all came you know, very, very close um, uh, personally to that uh, knowledge when, uh, when the tragic incident of Malaysia MH370 happened and we lost an aircraft. And everyone was asking how in the 21st century is it possible that we don't know where the aircraft is? And the answer is like, we didn't have space-based um, air traffic surveillance at that point in time. And so that is the huge difference. Simply put, without space-based surveillance, you don't know where the ship is. You don't know where the aircraft is. And how does, how does that monetize for the end customer? Sure. So, I mean, ever since uh, uh, the Queen of Spain sent, you know, good old Christopher out there with a whole bunch of gold and wondered, where are my ships, Christopher? <laughs> um, uh, we still have the same problem today. You know, you own a ship and you own some cargo and you want to know where it is. And without the space-based data, you don't. Or you want to figure out where are your competitors' vessels. So because you are chartering vessels and you want to find the right price to charge for, you know, the cargo hold. And if you know where all your competitors are, you know what the supply and demand might be in the harbor when you get there. If you run a harbor, you want to know when will what type of ships come in so that you can run the single most efficient operations understanding that harbors and airports are like the, the oxygen and, and lifeblood vessels of countries that have a lot of import and export. Um, uh, if you are an insurance uh, company, you want to know, okay, is that a reckless captain, Peter, that is driving his ship close to shore and into pirate infested waters in the middle of a storm, or it is smart and thoughtful Captain Matt's who is staying away using the waves and the winds to smooth his uh, his journey, well, Mads is going to get a better rate than Peter does, right? So um, from a, from a um, uh, illegal shipping uh, 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 perspective, you want to know if someone, you know, is, is shipping oil to an embargoed place, illegal fishing. Um, a third, uh, uh, about uh, about a third of the, of the world's population relies on fish for their protein supply, yet there are tens of billions of dollars of illegal fishing and overfishing happening every single year as vessels fish where they're not supposed to fish. There is close to $20 trillion of global trade happening on the oceans. 90% of all global trade happenings on the ocean. And 80% of the time, 
no one knows where they are unless they get a data feed from Spire. Weather is uh, impacting a third of the global economy. It is driven by massive amounts of data that has to come from all over Earth. 80% of uh, weather prediction forecasting is driven by data from space. And uh, uh, NVIDIA has been building uh, computationally highly efficient machines that can use data from us and models that they develop to uh, uh, make weather predictions far more um, uh, easily accessible than in the traditional way where it takes supercomputers many, many hours, tens of thousands of cores, machines that cost you know tens of hundreds of millions of dollars. They're democratizing the ability to predict the weather and create applications that help that third of the global economy that is impacted by weather um, manage that risk that is coming even higher and higher um, from climate change. And Spire is providing the raw data to drive for those models. And, uh, and and the collaboration is sort of paving the way because um, because the the models are not there and 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 maybe how do how do people monetize precise weather forecasts just again to understand um, if you are a logistics company you want to know where there might be delays if you run an airport you want to know um, uh, when there might be delays if uh, if you run um, a power plant you might want to know what the weather is because it's going to drive the demand for the electricity. If you run a network, you want to know when there's going to be thunder and lightning because that increases the risk for your um, for your network. If you are um, uh, in charge of, uh, of a large uh, swath of land, you want to know what is going to be the wind, the temperature and lightning risk because wildfires can come out. And depending on like the soil moisture that happening beforehand, the wind speed and other things, that could create a devastating disaster or not and no event whatsoever, just to stay with like a few examples here um, in the short period of time. It must be, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about the sales process because a lot of these customers, they probably don't know that they could uh, create some value by by buying your services. How do you approach that? Now, you're 100%, 100% right, Matt. So almost never someone says, oh, I have no use for knowing where my plane is. Everyone says like, I didn't know I can do this. Um, that is the far more common answer. So it is, you know, you go out and you do um, outreach, for example, on conferences, you do presentations, white papers, webinars, um, and you have inbound where people find you on your webpage and they have a conversation about, you know, hey, you know, could you help me, you know, optimize my flight path? Yes, we can. And this is how we can do this. Uh, oh, can you help me, you know, make sure that I, I harvest the crop at the right point in time? Yes, we can. We can help you do that. So it is both uh, uh, outreach to customers and tell the story of what is possible with space technology today, and then making them aware that space, which many people in the head associate with, you know, hundred billion million dollar, um, you know, massive bus size spacecraft, um, is actually something in the twenty first century that is created by spacecraft the size of a bottle of wine or a case of wine. For, for subscriptions that can be as low as $100,000 and make a massive difference on the bottom line of companies that are using our data subscriptions. So right now you're sort of, you're, you're, you're in the listening uh, business and, and data business. Um, you have this vision of, or you're comparing uh, Spire Global to AWS. Uh, could you tell us something about that and maybe just a, a, a bit of where you think uh, space tech uh, will be going uh, so yeah 100% if you tech. if you think about what amazon did you know they said we're going to be an e-commerce site and we're going to sell um you know books and and, and electronics is how they started but they thought you know everyone can buy everything and amazon is the everything store but for that they had to build a massive infrastructure in terms of hardware and software to run their e-commerce capability and then they recognized the revolutionary benefit of um computer data centers and the internet to change, you know, to change the world and said, we have the technology, it's very complex to build and develop. Why do we let other people rent it? And they created Amazon Web Services for other people to rent it. And, you know, and the rest is history. Spire had gone like a similar path. We had to develop a massive amount of infrastructure and capability, not just hardware, but software, ground stations, operations to run this massive constellation. And with the same understanding that space is improving 10x every five years and is in more and more uh, parts of life going to be integrated every single year, we said, well, we're going to let people rent our capabilities, and that is Spire Space Services, Amazon Web Services, Spire Space Services, where customers can rent our capabilities by giving us a piece of software to run on a spacecraft, a piece of hardware to run on a spacecraft, and you know um, uh, a full constellation capability that we can deploy for them using our capabilities, using our operations. And so they have far greater certainty, resilience. You know, we have done this 180 plus times, over 40 launches. 
We've got over 600 years of space heritage um, and they can focus on their business model exactly the same way as Amazon Web Services work. So we have customers that use our constellation to measure greenhouse gases, to do um, IO, 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 IoT um, uh, applications across the world. So um, I think uh, uh, those are just the starting points. You know, we're quite excited about things like space situational and awareness. Um, I think uh, security uh, and quantum encryption um, uh, and, and quantum computing will drive another huge wave of leveraging space because secure communications is a daily need and it's going to become more so of a need for everyone. And with quantum computing on Earth, you know, you're going to have quantum encryption and key distribution for which you're going to need space. Um, those are some things that we are excited about. I think as human beings, I'm quite excited about the moon economy, which I think is developing very, very rapidly, you know, in the time scale of space. But I think our children will certainly have an opportunity to visit the moon and it will be a full deployed um, uh, capability uh, because of the strategic and the scientific um, uh, relevance that it has. It is like the new version of Sputnik that happened in the late 50s. Uh, Peter Platzer, it's been a great pleasure to uh, to have you here. It's so interesting. I, I I like the company and and I love the space you're working in, uh, literally. Uh, so it's so interesting. So thanks a lot for uh, educating us a little bit and telling uh, us about uh, Spire Global. My pleasure. It was a sincere honor to be here, and I look forward to doing it again sometime soon. Thank you, Peter.